This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by Master of Pain, the new novel by Rath James White and Christopher Rufty. Melanie has always been attracted to assertive, dominant alpha males. She has always been curious about sadism and masochism, bondage and submission. But when she meets a man on an online BDSM website who calls himself Slave Master, she will experience a level of sadomasochism that goes far beyond safe, sane, and consensual. Inspired by the true story of America's first online serial killer and from the twisted minds of Wrath James White and Christopher Rufty comes a story of extreme violence, extreme sex, extreme perversion, and the occult. Obedience is mandatory and safe words are not allowed. Master of Pain by Wrath James White and Christopher Rufty. Available right now on Amazon.com in both Kindle and paperback from Death's Head Press. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f***! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f***! Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, YouTube, and all other platforms. Uh, I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. Now, if you're a listener, regular listener, you may know that for the last several weeks when I've introduced my roundtable of co-hosts, they have been, shall we say, less than energetic. So we're going to switch things up again today. They don't know which one of them I'm going to pick. We're going to compete and see which one of them is happiest to be here. First of all, joining me at the far end of the table, author Matt Wilson, co-host of the Grindcast. Hey, everybody. <laughs> well, that was an improvement. I fucking win. <laughs> Nobody's going to beat that. <laughs> to my left, the erudite and academic professor, Mary San Giovanni. Oh, yes. I'm so excited to be here. Was that... A response to the the I can, that was fake. I can tell when it's fake. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> I'll have what she's having. <laughs> was that in response to the the new Wrath James White Christopher Rufty book? It's just your presence. I was just, gonna, just your proximity. I was just going to say I think you guys should get royalties for that because that sounds like the uh, the story of how you two met. <laughs> 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 Let's put a pin in that. We'll yes. come back to that in just a moment. And of course, to my right, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave Thomas. Gah! Holy shit. We're That's sorry, headphone listeners. That's the show right there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. How many episodes are we up to? Five years and 200 and two, 221. This will be 221 two yeah, episodes. And that's the loudest and most energetic he's ever been. <laughs> All right. Well, coming up later in the show. Uh, me and Jonathan Mayberry and Lee Murray and Weston Oaks are going to sit down and we're going to talk about uh, the use of the military in horror fiction, uh, the military characters we've created in fiction, and how to craft realistic action scenes involving the military in your fiction. So we'd like you to stick around for that. Um, what we'd also like you to do is keep the dates of September 27th and September 28th free. Uh, because that is when we will be doing the third annual Horror Show with Brian Keene 24-hour charity telethon. Uh, this year, we're going to raise $30,000 in 24 hours for charity. And we're going to be doing it live at Dark Delicacies in Burbank, California. So keep the date free. Um, so, yeah, wow, Dave woke me up with that. <laughs> 
mean, Mary, no, if, you know, you woke me up too. But, I should hope but I, so. I hear you make that sound all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of which, we should oh we should uh, we should mention um, for only the second time ever in our five year award winning number one rated podcast history, we have recorded a special episode that you will only yes. be able to hear on the Project Entertainment Network's Patreon page. Why, yes. Yes, we do. Um, I believe that will be up. Uh, if you're listening to this on Thursday night, it'll be live as of tomorrow, Friday yes, morning. exactly. Um, ostensibly, <laughs> it was supposed to be a spoiler-filled discussion of Avengers <laughs> Endgame. Which it is. Sort of. To a point. <laughs> but it goes off the rails yeah. at the end. Yeah. And, and, and what was it, Matt? What, what did Mary and I end up talking about? Oh God, I don't remember. Dave, do you remember? Oh yeah, because I, you know, I, I, I edited it together uh, <laughs> for some unknown reason, as this show often does. <laughs> we, went it, 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 we went off in the weeds, and and we were discussing whether or not uh, people would pay money to watch Brian and Mary masturbate on uh, Pornhub. Okay, that's yeah. all right. Was. Yeah, yeah. how did that. we go from Adventures <laughs> Endgame? I need to go back and listen. I, it's, it's it's amazing. Just trust me. I think there was a reason I locked that out of my brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what was the segue involved it was, there? It was Tom Hiddleston. Yeah, it was Tom Hiddleston. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. She because, got all rustled. Because you, you, you <laughs> that her you like have, got rustled. I was rustled like you a leaf. have rubbed one out to Tom Hiddleston. I, no, is that actually, what it was? No, I don't. Well, it was either that or the fact that you you and uh, Shermar Moore are, are dead ringers oh, for yes, each other. Oh, yes, that was it, yeah. yes. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like me and Idris Elba, yeah. right? Yeah. Uncan- <laughs> we look exactly wait, like it. You're not <laughs> Idris Elba? I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> hey, I, I'd rub one out to Shamar Moore. I mean, come on. Oh, that, that's a good-looking yeah, man. That's a good-looking man. That's a good-looking man. man. There's nothing to his about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a good-looking guy. You never mentioned, you know that coming up is the last season of Criminal Minds. You I did know not. That? I know I'm oh. like a season behind. Oh yeah, because I am too. Because they took it off. It's not on Netflix. Well, it's on Netflix, but they don't put the new episodes on anymore. But oh, yeah, the upcoming no. season. It's only ten episodes. <laughs> really? Yep. Yeah. I, I I didn't hear you mention that, so I thought I should make. I you, didn't know. You know. Now you know. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to catch up. We're gonna yeah. have to. We're gonna have to binge watch the last season. Uh, the the because I'm. I think I'm only one season behind. Criminal Minds makes me uncomfortable. And I know it's a procedural network right. Well, it's based on a drama, lot of yeah. real serial killer stuff. There's so many episodes that involve children, oh, and that, that shit hard. is a trigger for me. It's hard to watch that sometimes. Show is, that show is hard to watch. Like, like We kind of sort of binge-watched it on Netflix. Like the I forget how many seasons you're up to, but all but the last two seasons are on Netflix. If you never watched it, you can watch it. But literally, we'll watch like three episodes and like, okay, I need to shower now. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it's like, yeah. But, but here's the thing of it: is a lot of it, it's especially from the first season, yeah, the first are taken from like John Douglas's oh, yeah. cases, and and you know, it's, it's it's rough. It's real case. There there have been episodes that have been. There's a couple episodes that are as creepy. And this is network television. Too, mm-hmm. As creepy as any horror film I've ever seen. The ones with uh, Tim Curry. Wasn't that, that a two-parter? Uh, yeah, it was a two-parter. Um, it was brilliant. No, there was one where done. these people were kidnapping children and burning them in an incinerator, yes. and it was just like, yes. oh my god! <laughs> what <did> he's <laughs> Matt and I are doing our own show. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you amused, <laughs> Matt? Do you watch Criminal Minds? No, Matt. Do you do you and your your wife? have uh the celebrity wish list where if you ever meet this celebrity you're allowed to sleep with them no strings attached I can't say i ever had to talk about it no, no. see see because normal people don't do that yeah we don't, I, I don't we don't have that because i'm nobody i know yeah. it's never gonna happen <laughs> that's, 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 see, this is my point whenever this topic comes up everybody's like oh you have your celebrities like, no 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 you don't have the celebrity no. list you have like the hot girl at the burger king or you know yeah yeah you know or, or, or the, the starbucks barista that's really attractive like to have them on your list that might Mary happen thinks shamar moore should be on her list and I, I vetoed that because we could meet Shamar more. Well, that's we the thing. We, we can't even do we, it because we, really, we know people. Yeah. We know. I mean, we've met people on our respective lists. And Aaron, it's just, remember Aaron Gray from Buck Rogers? Yes. When oh, you were yeah. a kid, Aaron Gray was on my list. And then I found myself at a convention bar in Cincinnati <laughs> having drinks with Aaron Gray. Now, she was perfectly delightful and I was perfectly delightful and I, I never brought it up. But it occurred to me at that point, holy shit. Yeah, you know, we, the, yeah. the list is always that was a fantasy before my thing. time. Um, but, you know. Well, so. yeah, like Brian Krause hmm. was on my list. I met him. Who? Brian Krause. Who's he? Oh, um, I thought you said Cranston. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, holy shit, really? I was like, great actor, but. <laughs> All right. Is it Malcolm's dad, huh? All right. Yeah. <laughs> a weird fetish. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> not, Malcolm's not the only one in the middle. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I always, I always like to envision the first time listener. You know, <laughs> Brian Cranston, you like to... in. <laughs> yeah. uh, What the you know, hell am I listening Jonathan to? Jan. This week it's a Lee Murray fan, and, and they're turning in to hear her <laughs> talk about military, and they're, they're getting this instead. We apologize, and we promise no, we if, you, if you'll hang out, <laughs> I don't we'll, apologize. we'll get to Lee Murray. We promise. <laughs> yeah. But uh, all right, let's like, go to. Let's go. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, if I had to pick a person, and I can't remember this actress's name right now, but she was in the Labyrinth. Labyrinth? She oh, was the, Jennifer Connelly? Yes. I think she's beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she's pretty. I don't have a list. Well, I don't so, either. If I just off the top of my Mary head. Mary and I are at the know. places in our career where like, like I said, meeting Aaron Gray in a bar, you know, it's not like she I should clarify, because it's <laughs> it's the internet and people will take everything I say out of context. Aaron Gray was not in the bar looking for strange, okay? <laughs> it was it was Sunday at the convention. The convention was over. Nobody's flights were leaving yet. Aaron Gray was a guest at the convention. I was a guest at the convention. Aaron Gray was sitting in the bar enjoying a, a, a drink. She may not, it may have been a soda she was having. I don't even, and, and I was in the bar enjoying a bourbon. As you do. We struck up a conversation that was perfectly pleasant, and then she went her way, and I went mine. So I, I, I don't need some pinhead on the other. Oh, Brian Keith said No, you this, know what? So. You need to do, Dave. You need to go back through the show's. Uh, archives and reword that so it just sounds like he's saying Aaron Gray was on my strange. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. We to met him. in a bar and <laughs> no, because that, that'll get Kevin Strange wound up. Yeah, all no. yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's finally. We, settled we, down. Don't, we, want we, do we not, don't want that. We do not want that. No, yeah, no, so. please. You know what we do want? We want the news. Sure, okay. that's sure. why do, do, people do. are tuning. They're not tuning in to hear Mayberry and and Weston and Lee. They're, <laughs> they're tuning in. <laughs> To hear our unique take on the nose. Uh, uh, on the on news. The nose. <laughs> the news on the nose. Jesus, I can't talk today. All right. Ooh. Uh, if you're a regular listener to the show, then you'll know that all year we've been covering the the controversies in the bizarro fiction genre, uh, which, you know, do, in fact, dovetail with the horror genre. And uh, we've talking been talking about how Eraserhead Press, the premier bizarro publisher, has been changing many of their policies, etc. Matt and Mary are freaking out right now because there is what they think is a wasp flying around it's in the studio. It's like Mothra. It's ginormous. No, that's a mud dauber. And if you go oh, back yeah, and listen... It doesn't have the tail on the yeah, end. Yeah, if you go back and listen to uh, the Harlan, Episons, uh, Harlan Ellison episode from last year, it was that same mud dauber flying around oh, the studio. Oh, I remember it, And yes. you had the same reaction. Yeah, because it's big and scary. Yeah. It's yeah. huge. It's he's, like a it's like a 747 of bugs. He's not going to sting you. You better they, not. They don't have stingers. Okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to watch some jackass on Twitter be actually, Brian Keene, I'm an entomologist. And, and they are hi- highly <laughs> deadly. <laughs> so, yeah. A racer had- the dinosaurs are dead, jackass. <laughs> Mud daubers. <laughs> <laughs> Took them all out. <laughs> <laughs> Eraserhead Press have announced this week to their authors a new social media policy. Huh. Uh, now, disclaimer, I am published via their imprint, Deadite Press, so this also impacts me. Uh-oh. So Uh-oh. technically, this also impacts the show. Um, <laughs> Whoops. I'm going to just read it verbatim, and then we'll discuss it. Okay. Quote, we encourage you to use social media in marketing and promoting your books. How you interact with your readers and peers online is important to your success as an author, and everything you post should reflect positively on your brand and ours. You are responsible for the content you publish on blogs, wikis, social network platforms, and other forms of user-generated media. And our expectation is that you utilize those outlet, outlets ethically and responsibly. Um, they go on to say that, you know, most online media platforms have a set of community standards and standards and or an anti-harassment policy. And they expect their authors to follow those individual guidelines at all times. They go on, also go on to say, uh, quote, we ask that you ensure that your use of social media does not harm or otherwise injure other authors, readers, or potential readers, the press, its staff, or any social media users. Uh, Posting defamatory, derogatory, or inflammatory content, cyberbullying, harassment, or anything that poorly represents our company is not allowed. If you violate this policy, we will address our concerns with you and take corrective action, which may include canceling your contract and removing your books from print. Please remember that the Internet never forgets. 
Uh, this means everything you publish will be visible to the world for a very, very long time. One small derogatory remark could come back to haunt you 10 years down the line. Common sense is a huge factor here. Just ask James quote. Gunn. <laughs> yeah, just ask him. <laughs> So, I mean, how do we feel about that? I mean, it seems kind of st- pretty standard, I pretty think, standard, honestly. Right? Yeah. yeah, and, you know, the, the part about uh, should reflect positively on your brand and ours. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. If you, if the guideline that you're setting is that you don't violate the uh, rules of conduct of the social ma- media platform that you are working on, mm-hmm. then I think that's fair. And I think a lot of companies ask that you don't, you know, reflect. If you if you are in the public eye, that you don't reflect negatively on their company or your brand as part of their company. But I think if a publisher or other company is going to take it a step farther and try to police, uh, police isn't the right word. If you're trying to keep track of what people are saying, um, something like the term inflammatory can be subjective. That I'll admit. And, you know, I love Rose. I love Eraserhead Mm -hmm. Press. They've been very good to me over the years. Right. Um, the part that said posting derogatory content gave me pause only because I have no bones about being derogatory when someone deserves it. You know, mm-hmm. Vox Day right. Right. or Kevin Strange or, you know, some of these fucking Nazi edgelords or, mm-hmm. or some of these nuts on the other side of the political spectrum, right. too. Um, you know, I, I have I have no problem being derogatory regarding a, a publisher, for example. Right. That's ripping off and harming authors in this industry. But I do my research. I present the facts. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not doing anything defamatory that can get me sued. Right. And that's the thing. I think, you know, you can say, you know, don't put libel on your social media platform. You know, don't um, violate the rules of conduct. Don't violate the, you know, the, the rules of usage of this particular social media. I mean, I, I, I think because I know where, I know what Rose is going for, and I think it's very admirable. Um, but here's the thing. What constitutes inflammatory? Right. Because we live in an era. Now, All every everyone in this studio is over the age of 40, correct? Matt, you're, are you over no, 40? No, I'm not. Oh, so you're the fucking millennial in the studio. <laughs> no, um, but, I'd like to uh, say I'm No, not. I don't think it... <laughs> <laughs> Politics, it's become so divisive now on both sides. And I'm not trying to sound like a a moderate middle of the road, you know, type of can't we all just get along here? Because in in 2019, that's to to crib from Robin Williams. That's like a, you know, a traffic cop on Prozac. Um, (laughs) But good analogy. Yes. It has become so inflammatory on both sides. And if, if if someone who identifies as right posts a a standard right opinion, the left sees that as inflammatory. And if someone on the left posts a standard left of opinion, the right sees that as inflammatory. So what constitutes inflammatory on social media in 2019? And how can any publisher... Be it Disney, be it Eraserhead Press, be it Simon and Schuster, how how can any publisher effectively police that? I don't think there's a way. I don't think there's a way to do it unless you literally spell out very, very specifically what you mean by that. And even then, I I think you know a lot of that's going to be up to interpretation, which is going to be a huge headache for anybody trying to oversee that. Um, I think that a lot of people have built. Part of their brand is specifically to talk about politics. Um, for me personally, politics doesn't come up very often unless it affects somebody directly that I love. You know, um, usually, you know, gay and trans rights is, is an issue for me because people I love, you know, fall into that category and, and I want them to be safe and I want them to be healthy and I want them to be in a place where they don't have to worry about walking down the street and getting their asses kicked for something that, you know. Right. Right. Uh, should never be an issue. Um, and I generally tend to, you know, be sort of an equalitarian. I am kind of, a, I think, a moderate person. I, I, I think everybody should have this access to the same 
benefits and and the same rights and um but for the most part i think you know politics isn't part of my work i don't think politics comes up very often in, in books that i write so it isn't part of the platform of social media but if you are the kind of writer who is who does tend to have politically charged work then avoiding something like politics would be sort of a deficit to your brand right well exactly you take uh I'm trying to think of a a friend of ours who won't mind me using them as an example. Let's take uh, Nick Mamatas or John Scalzi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, politics imbues their work. Yes. Uh, particularly in Nick's case. So it, it it's part of his brand, and I hate to put it in, in those capitalist terms, Nick. And I, I know you're cringing right now, but <laughs> it, is, it is part of Nick's brand right. to talk about politics. And I, I would dare say there are some people who would say that some of the things Nick has said over the years could be considered inflammatory. Yes. In fact, <laughs> most of the people <laughs> I know outside of, say, the horror genre who know Nick <laughs> or outside of the speculative fiction genre who know Nick think of him as an inflammatory kind of person. Right. And they could say With the same love. about me. You know, yes. it all goes back to Maurice Broaddus' classic essay, which I think is almost like a decade old now, <laughs> you know, about Brian Keenan and Nick Mamatas are assholes. <laughs> Which I still think is one of the greatest things anyone has ever written about me. <laughs> um, yeah. But, so yeah, I, I don't know how you police that. You know, you, you bring up a great point. I love Christopher Golden. Chris is one of my best friends. We do another uh, sister podcast to the show together every week. If Chris needed a kidney, I would give him one. I'd give you one too, David. I you know. need one, but you haven't asked yet. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not going to need one. But, so. <laughs> you know, Chris does not populate my Facebook feed for a reason. <laughs> and it's not because I necessarily disagree with his politics. We don't agree on everything. Right. He and I do not agree on the Second Amendment. We've had that debate live in front of people, and, and we walk away still friends. But it's it's all... The world is horrible all the time in his feed, and I need a break from that sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, you know, that, I don't know if that's Chris's brand or not. In a, in a, a case like Nick, it certainly is. In the case of Chris, I've often wondered to myself, and I've never asked him this, but I'm kind of doing it now live on the air, is that somehow detrimental to his brand? I think Chris, knowing Chris, he'd tell you, well, I don't give a shit if it's detrimental or not. Right. This is important to me. Right. I'm going to talk about it. Right. Right. Um, but as more and more publishers are creating social media policies like this, mm -hmm. I just, the, the policing of it, it's it, it, to put it in country terms, it's, it, it seems like it's going to be hurting pigs. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be a headache to anybody who tries to undertake that because I mean, it's one thing to say, I don't care if readers who disagree with me politically stop reading me. It's another thing to say. And again, I hate to put it in such mercenary terms, but it's another thing to say, I'm going to get fired from my publisher if I say this. You know, like it's it's that's a that's a difficult thing to navigate, right. I think, you know. Right. Well, you know, speaking of politics, um, Joe Hill, friend of ours, friend of the show. Well, not a friend to, to Matt, but <laughs> just, Aww, just because Matt's lying. never met him. I, I'm sure Joe <laughs> would think you were delightful if you met don't, you. Don't do that. I've but, never met him either, so. You've but he's still, your, no. he's still no. your friend. Though. Okay, well, friend to Mary and I. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Occasional <laughs> listener, friend to Mary and I. Um, <laughs> Maybe Dave and I should just go do our own fucking thing. You know? then? We'll just make our own You're, you're Joe Hillless world. <laughs> right, Brian? <laughs> we can't all be jackass McFuckface. You know? <laughs> all these fantastic, famous friends and toad about it every week <laughs> on our fucking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you're tuning in for you, Matt. If you're tuning in for Jonathan Mayberry and Lee Murray and Weston Oaks, they'll be up at just <laughs> once Jack Aspen fuckface is done with the news. But uh, Joe uh, on his own pud. Joe, like 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 many of us, uh has his newsletter. His is called Escape Hatch. Yeah. And uh I found this really interesting. He did a poll of his newsletter readers about what they wanted to see more of, what they want to see less of in the newsletter. One of the questions was politics. Um the majority, a slight majority, wanted him to continue talking about politics in the newsletter. Yeah, and Joe has never been shy. Much, you oh, know, no, he's, no, yeah, but, he's very open you know, about he, his he, political he, stances. Yeah. yeah, um, but a slight majority 
wanted him to continue talking about politics in the newsletter. Um, a slight minority did not want him to. And, and here's, I'm just going to read verbatim from his newsletter. He says, I think I'm going to disappoint some folks here. While a slight majority of you are interested in my political thoughts of the moment, a healthy number of respondents would rather I spare them. And I'm inclined to let the minority call it this time. Here's my thinking. And this is the important part. Mm -hmm. A newsletter is a thing that arrives in your inbox, dropped through the digital mail slot. I came to you. You didn't come to me, except to sign up, and you can always unsubscribe at any time. It's a little like someone knocking on your door and asking for a minute of your time. If someone gives you a minute, don't be an asshole. Escape hatch is, first and foremost, an escape. And maybe one of the things we're escaping here is the outrage of the moment, the partisan shit fight of the day. I think that's a really, yeah. really smart way yeah. of yeah. handling this. Yeah, I, I, think, agree. I think it ties exactly into our first discussion there. Yes. yes. Um, you know, he goes on to say, anyone genuinely interested in my political think can get it over on my blog. Uh, on the blog, the relationship is different. I didn't come to you. You came to me. Right. That's mm -hmm. pretty much always been how I handle it. Now, there are some times where something moves me to the point where right. I feel I have to, you know. Yeah, but your speak newsletter is very, asked. very rarely ever political. It's right. mostly just here's what I'm doing. Here's well, what I'm working on. Well, that's pretty much how I handle social media too. Well, that's, if, that's, if someone will ask me, I'm not shy about about exactly. giving them an answer because yeah. my politics are, I would say nuanced. Others, others would say schizophrenic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like nuanced. <laughs> nuanced is good. You know. Uh, I, and I'm happy to clarify where I stand on an issue right. if if a reader or a fan asks. Well, um, but I, I tend not to use my brand, my social media presence, as a bully pulpit for politics. Um, and I, I, th I think Joe is onto something here. I, I think maybe as more of these publishers and such enact these policies. That maybe this is this is the way to approach it. Well, if it's something like Twitter, though, who's coming to who? Would you say well, the they're coming to me? They're following me. Yeah, they're following. Okay, you. so they're they're okay. actively, so they're, they're searching, they're actively for you searching for whatever yeah. content you want to put on there. Yeah, um, but you know, again, I'm not going to beat them over the head all day with politics, just because my myself as a a user of social media, I can only take so much of that, and then yeah, it begins yeah. to impact my own. Right. Well, well, you know, because I, I find that sometimes, too, even when it's politics I agree with, if people are so obstinate and hostile about how they deliver it, it sometimes puts me off, even if I totally agree with what they're saying. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, that was that was an interesting take. So we're that not, obviously I like the, that. the four yeah. of us are not going to solve the issue for everybody. Uh, but perhaps Not this today. episode will inspire a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps the, the, this, there will be a discussion taking place on social media. <laughs> And it will and, not. And it, it will not be inflammatory. Uh, it will constitute. Well, yeah. Jack S. McFuckface yeah. is just wrong. Yeah. He's just wrong about everything. All and right. We'll say that that hasn't taken on yet. I don't know <laughs> how many more fucking episodes I got to do it till it takes on. You got to get Wiley Young to make you a meme. Oh, yeah, that's what that's, it. Not, uh, that's, that's not of, that's not of myself. Like, for when change, you talk right? about Jack S. McFuckface, am I the only one that picks pictures like Mayor McCheese? <laughs> I do yes. now. Yeah, <laughs> I did have one one wait, wait. person at Stoker's Con is came up to me on your list and asked, no. me, to, oh, asked no. me to sign a book as Jack S. McFuckface. Really? I refused oh, to do oh. it. I, I said oh. you don't want me to do that. Oh. And then they said, No, I don't want you to do that. But <laughs> no, because then it's not worth as much when I sell it on eBay. So yeah. it's, it's 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 one listener. One listener, you have touched. Matt. <laughs> I've done my work. Hey, I can finally ride off I've into been the on, sunset. I've been on this show for five years. I, I've touched no one. So. Speaking, of, speaking of touching <laughs> oh listeners. Oh, my. Who are we touching? Uh, let's, let's get to our final news item. Uh, Christian <laughs> Jensen. Oh, God. <laughs> of the bad touch. Yes. <laughs> Erotica, Bizarro, and horror author Christian Jensen. Uh, if you're a longtime listener, he is, of course, no stranger <laughs> to you. He is one of our most popular Yes. Recurring guests. What would he, the Stern Show equivalent of Christian Jensen be? Oh, jeez. Crackhead Bob? <laughs> <laughs> no. Aww. No, because Christian's, you know, much. Christian Jensen's actually a really intelligent person. No, he is. Yeah, and I'm trying and to think, like, who's like a, someone's on that show a lot that 
I, I can't think it's Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a good comparison. Works. That's actually a really good comparison. Yeah, because yeah, because when Gilbert comes on the Stern Show, it's chaos, <laughs> and when Christian comes on the show, if you've never heard it, go back. It's like episode fourteen or something. It's me, Brian. Jeff Cooper and Christian Jensen, and it's two hours of insanity. Yeah. <laughs> two hours of the, the word second fuck. Yeah. over His and over again. Second appearance yeah. is my favorite. Dungeon Master for new oh, listeners. Yeah. That's uh, that's my eleven year old son. We don't mention his name on mm-hmm. the air. Dungeon Master was like seven at the time, oh. yeah. and Christian's dropping f bombs left and right, yeah. and Dungeon Master comes up to the microphone all serious and just just <laughs> schools him and chews him out for using inappropriate language in front of a minor. Oh, You've never oh, seen oh. Christian Jensen yeah. curl into a ball of shit. So oh. funny. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. Awesome. But yeah, he's yeah. a very popular <laughs> yes. guest on the show. Um, actually, our most listened to YouTube episode is that second appearance where Dungeon Master. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know why. <laughs> but but, is, but uh, he... Of course, I think we covered it last year. He's gotten into acting. Right. Yes. Um, yes. Well, uh, Slasher 15 Productions, the, the indie film company, have uh, just announced a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign for their next movie, which is called Bloody Summer Camp. Uh, it is, of course, uh, you know, a, a throwback to all the 80s slasher movies. Um, David Kerr, the writer and director at Slasher 15, says, quote, we have a huge assortment of perk packs from pre-orders of the film, uh, all the way up to you, Matt. You could bid and actually be the killer in the film. Wow, That's wouldn't cool. your wouldn't your wife be proud of you? That <laughs> she'd say she's never proud. The of fact that, that you come <laughs> over here every week and hang out with us has finally led to something. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're killing surplus teenagers in an indie horror movie. <laughs> well, at least it's that. It ain't going to be books. So. <laughs> Yeah, Bloody Summer Camp's Kickstarter, they need $10,000. Uh, as of the time we're recording this, um, they're almost halfway there already. Oh, uh, so, nice. That's yeah. cool. Congrats. Um, it's an all-or-nothing campaign, so if they don't get the $10,000, uh, then they're not going to get any of the funds, so no oh. worries about that. Um, if it is successfully flund- funded, uh, filming is slated to begin spring of 2020 at Camp Holiday Trails in Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh, okay. Um, so why am I bringing this up in regards to Christian Jensen? Well, I assume um, he's in the movie. Christian's got the lead role in the uh, movie. Uh, him and Rita <laughs> Christine. Uh, so, you know, personally, as a fan of Christian's, right. as a friend of the show, I'd like to see this succeed. So go to Kickstarter, Bloody Summer Camp. Um, you can also find them on Facebook at Bloody Camp. Twitter at Bloody Camp, and Instagram at Bloody Summer Camp. So, yeah, Kickstarter. And you know what? I got a surprise for all three of you. Ooh. Christian will be here in studio with us on next week's show. Woo-hoo! Nice. So there you go, listeners. If you thought the Jonathan Jans and Jeremy <laughs> Wagner interviews were something, just wait for Oh, the- just wait. My God, people love that Jonathan Jans interview, speaking of which. Well, it was an amazing interview. I, mean, I should probably I, listen to it. Yeah, you should. I think I'm the only one on the planet who has it because he, sa- he says things I've never heard him say before about himself. And I was curious to hear your responses to these. So you oh. need to listen to it. Maybe I need to go back and listen. I don't remember what I said. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I, you know, no, you, you I, look, guys, I, I it's love almost Jonathan. Like a, it's almost like a psychotherapy session. Yeah, and, and, I, I love yeah. Jonathan. Um, oh, no, he's one of the most amazing he, people ever. He, he has the disarming ability to get me to relax and not be on. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, he he probably got me to say some things that I normally would not cop to yeah. or admit. Yeah. Um. So, you know, God and Cthulhu bless him for that. Um, no, it's it, it's fascinating. And I I I knew he was one of our most requested guests. People have been since we started the oh, show. Oh yeah, five years. People the, have been the, wanting Jonathan Johnson. The response online to this has been insane. Yep. Like I I just I'm blown away by how many people were like, you know, just oh my god, thanks for thanks for doing this and best interview ever. Yeah, I think know. I think yeah. Maurice Maurice brought us. Wow. I love you. You are my brother. <laughs> you know that, but uh, I, I think Jonathan Jans has dethroned you as our our most popular episode ever. We'll see because he's only been up. It's only been out for a week, and, and Maurice has like a three year head start. Well, that's true. <laughs> so, that's true. Yeah. Download yeah. wise, three year yeah, head yeah, three year head start. Uh, plus, you guys weren't drinking in this interview, unlike uh, Maurice. 
So, well, this is true. This is true. And Reese, Jonathan Jan's son wasn't there to throw him under the bus. Reese's son did. So, that was great. Which is still one of the greatest show moments ever. If you haven't heard that, people, you need to go listen to that because it's totally unplanned. <laughs> that's see, that's always my favorite thing. And so, like in the Stern shows, the same way, where some random person that you don't expect also just throws out a piece of information that steers well, the interview. And, and Maurice yeah. off, you know, off yeah. mic. He's like, you know, he never does that. Yeah. He never does that. Yeah. But then I forget, he's been around Uncle Brian his entire life. Of course he's going to do, do it on your show, yeah. And you are a bit of a bad influence sometimes. Yeah. I love those children. I taught wow. those children how to cheat at Magic the Gathering when they were only six years old. <laughs> that's, a, that's a worthwhile skill. Yeah. You know, you're putting out your college application. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, what kind of uh, you know, community service is done? Why can you cheat at Magic the Gathering? Oh, you're into Harvard. <laughs> that's what are, it. What are your need... special skills <laughs> for this job yeah. you're applying for? <laughs> <laughs> we All need right. such ingenious skills. Yes. Well, why don't we go to because right now the Mayberry fans are like fast forward, fast forward, <laughs> Jackass McFly face, fast forward. Do they ever shut up? <laughs> why don't we go to the interview? But before we do that, um, I want to remind you this week's show is brought to you by Master of Pain, a new collaborative novel by Rath James White and Christopher Rufty, two of the biggest names. In Splatterpunk and Extreme Horror, uh, Master of Pain. Uh, you know, look, it comes with a trigger warning right there in the book description. Uh, from the twisted minds of Wrath James White and Christopher Rufty comes a story of extreme violence, sex, perversion, and the occult. Obedience is mandatory and safe words are not allowed. You kind of know what yeah, you're getting yeah. into right there yeah. if you buy the I would book, think so, okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is not Ramsey Campbell. <laughs> This is, this is not. This Thomas, is not Robert Aikman. This, this is not Thomas Zagatti. <laughs> um, so, Master of Pain. That's Subtino. out from from Death's Head Press. It's available right now on Amazon in both Kindle and paperback. Um, and of course, Death's Head Press, man, they're really blowing up. Yeah, here. yeah, they're doing putting great. out a lot of stuff. Uh, you can follow them on Facebook or Twitter, Death Head Press on Twitter. So we thank them for sponsoring this week's show. All right. Let's go to the military panel discussion, and we'll catch you on the flip side. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm the moderator. My name is Weston Oaks. Um, I spent 35 years in the, in the military. I'm still in the military. Last year, I was in Afghanistan, and uh, 2013, I was in Afghanistan. And I hope that in three more years, I'm never in Afghanistan, because it's a really sucky-ass place. Um, but all of us have uh, a little bit of history with with the military and we all have a little bit of um, um, subject we want to talk about specifically with horror in the military which is a very easy thing to do um, and I'd like to ask um, starting with Brian the other members of the panel to kind of just introduce themselves in how, however way you want to, to introduce yourself hi I'm Brian Keen um, and this microphone does not come out can everybody hear me yeah. okay great um, it stretch any further. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you all know me as a, a writer, or from my comic books, or from my podcast. Uh, before any of that, uh, I was in the Navy. Um, I was uh, on uh, the USS Austin, an LPD. It's the type of ship that they don't have anymore. It's basically a troop carrier. Uh, you know, there's the old adage that Marines and Navy guys don't get along on a troop carrier. That's bullshit. Uh, at our reunions, we we invite the Marines. Uh, they were as much our brothers as as, as we were. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, I uh, I did four years. I got out. Uh, I occasionally go to Langley in Virginia as a civilian, as uh, sort of a consultant, I guess. Uh, not very recently. They have a Brian uh, Keene writers group right there. They, they have, yes, they yeah, do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I I, I have, you know anybody can go to. Quantico FBI headquarters and take a tour. Uh, you can't just take a tour of Langley, so I will I will freely admit it is very fucking cool to watch a show like The Blacklist and see what they got wrong about the inside of Langley and, and what they actually kind of got right. So. And you'll leave. Hi, um, I'm Lee Murray and I come from a little bit south of here. Um, and I, I write military fiction, but I'm Probably more adept with a vegetable knife than I am. I've never, I've only ever once held any firearms, and that was in research for my book. 
I have never been in the military. We don't even have a very big military in New Zealand. Yeah, but um, your fiction is so good that you are one of the most, or the most, um, awarded uh, novelist writer in, in New Zealand. Yeah, yes. I'm New Zealand's most awarded science fiction and fantasy yeah, that's writer. Something to be said. Thank you, yeah. thank you. But yeah, so um, so I come from the, the the perspective of the absolute layperson. I haven't been to Afghanistan. Um, you know, so I've come from the perspective of having to do the research and not know anything. And also, there are not enough girls writing this stuff. That's true. Agreed. So, um, and there is almost nothing that I'm aware of that is written apart from my own stuff in New Zealand. So, you know, there was a big gap and someone needed to fill it. And so I jumped in. So that's cool. me. Uh, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I, I write... Uh, and a lot of different genres, one of which is, is weird science, military spec op stuff, um, but other things as well. I know military history, though I have done a lot of consulting work with SWAT uh, teams, and uh, I used to have a company called CopSafe where we teach arrest and control workshops for cops so they didn't want to have, have shooting people um, because a lot of police are under-trained, underfunded and therefore under-trained, so we had that. Uh, but I also worked as a bodyguard and uh, so on, 55 years in martial arts. So got a, a background in, in, in hand-to-hand and weapon combat, but uh, no military background. Uh, so I do a ton of research, uh, ask the right questions. If I get it right, it's because of the people who advise me. If I get it wrong, it's all on me. Or in one case, my editor. Do you know the editor story? I got me. I got to tell the editor story. <laughs> I, I was, real quick, I was going on a book tour when one of my novels, Dead of Night, was coming out. It was about, it was about to go to, uh, to print. And my editor thought I had made a mistake with a handgun um, because he plays a lot of first-person shooter games and assumes that means he actually <laughs> knows handguns. So the two cops get out of the car. They, they, you know, they have uh, Glock 26s. And um, at no point are they taking the safety off. So he says, oh, my God, it's maybe I made a mistake. There is no safety on, the, on that particular handgun. Since that book came out, I've heard from everyone who has ever even heard the word Glock, including a Glock regional sales guy. Um, <laughs> you got it wrong. <laughs> it was the only, I mean, I, I'll own up to my own mistakes. That's on him. So I, I, there's a standing death threat that if he <laughs> does that again, I, I'm going to kill him. But, yeah. so, so John just, you know, kind of, kind of passively said, I have 55 years of martial arts experience. He, he, he forgot to mention he's in the Black Belt Hall of Fame. Yeah. I mean, he, he knows more than all of us put together, I'm sure. So, so let's talk about military and fiction. Um, uh, I think we've kind of proven that you don't have to be, have been in the military to have, you know, write military fiction. So if that's the case, then what is it about military fiction, and, 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 and before we get to horror, what is it about the military fiction that you're able to write so well? And I'll start with John. Um, well, first off, you know, I grew up in the year right during and after the uh, Vietnam War. Everybody's uncle, brother, or dad was in Vietnam, and especially in my neighborhood, where there, you know you didn't have anybody who could keep you out of out of Vietnam. You you were going to go, you were going to get drafted. And my you know my brother went to Vietnam and uh, with a bunch of his friends, and he's the only one that came back. And he did one doing three tours. Um, so I, I I grew up in a world where everyone I knew was in the military, and we heard stories all the time. I mean, Christmas and Thanksgiving were basically members of my family swapping stories of either Vietnam, Korea, or World War II. And I heard, heard about it, and I was fascinated. When I started writing this stuff, um, well, actually, when I started teaching uh, the police uh, workshops, a lot of those guys, especially the guys in SWAT, had usually were military first, uh, who then joined SWAT. And I started learning things about that that I didn't understand. Like, in, on TV, SWAT is always presented as a kill them all, that God sort them out sort of mentality. And yet, if SWAT actually shows up on the scene, the chances of anyone dying have just dropped because they control the scene. Um, that's something I didn't know. So I, what I found is if I let these guys talk and I paid attention, I'd find really interesting shit out that I can put in my books. I also found that if I was providing the pizza and beer, they would keep talking all damn night long. And I'd find out some really good stories. And that's what I did. And I, I, I do research by listening and paying attention and respecting what I hear and sometimes asking them to vet how that, you know, comes out in my fiction. Uh, because I, I want to get it right. I actually, you know, just so I have people who ask me to vet their, their fight scenes, you know, unarmed combat fight scenes, I want to make sure that what I write is true to, respects, um, 
the, uh, their experience, military experience, and at the same time, that inf- reinforces the reality of the sh- of the story. So that when I ask somebody susp- to suspend disbelief, it's not in how the military acts; it's in when I, when I go off off into some weird area, you know, horror or science fiction or something. Nice. But it's grounded on that reality. Believe. Yeah, that's true. Definitely true. Um, we, when you ask the question about what it is that, that appeals and what about military mm-hmm. military fiction, you know, for me, obviously, I've not been in the military. So, what is it that that does appeal about that kind of that kind of writing? And I think it's that idea of brotherhood and the relationships. Obviously, they're, they're so important. So that idea of brotherhood and putting yourself you know, second to your country or your community or your your fellow your fellow um, military Soldier. soldiers, Soldier. yeah, whatever, yeah. or even just the people in your group, the people that you're with at the time. So I think that those are universal ideas um, that I think that p- everyone's looking for, especially in this time of me, me, me. Right. Um, you know, it's people who are selfless and will put themselves put themselves in positions that are that are where they put their lives at risk. Over and above, um, you know, uh, just just that selflessness that we just don't see anymore. And so I think that that's something that really appeals in these in these mm-hmm. these uh, military fiction. But the other thing for me in New Zealand is that um, we just don't have any gun culture. We don't have any of this culture. So it's quite. It's, it's new and fresh and surprising and shocking. And in some ways, that I think perhaps there's an interest in investigating that now. You know, in New Zealand, we have an armed defender squad, and that comes out when there's some kind of armed incident. But basically, you know, I'm 54 years old, and I lived in New Zealand most of my life, and I have never seen anyone, anyone, with a gun. Anyone. Not customs, not the police, not you know, not the army. And what's really interesting is that just a few weeks ago we had an incident and the first time I ever saw a gun in a policeman's hand in New Zealand was on the television. So so I think there's a now you know, now I think there's even more of an interest in this in military fiction and, and um and fiction involving weaponry, and so perhaps there might be a bit more of an impetus in, in our country, but certainly for, for me, the military fiction, just because the newness of it, the fact that there wasn't anything out there, um, and that perhaps appealed to people because they, haven't, they hadn't explored that in a New Zealand context. If I can jump in Absolutely. real quick before Brian talks um, with, a, with a humorous anecdote. Um, so I was in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, of all places, and I was with the um, Australian J2X, which means he's an Australian uh, human expert for the entire military. And human means human intelligence. And uh, I'm sitting there with him and his assistants, and we're having dinner at a really good sushi place in Salt Lake City, believe it or not. And, um, and he's talking about how Americans are going crazy. And he says, yeah, you Americans are so gun crazy, I can't believe it. And it's like, we're not gun crazy, what are you talking about? And he says, how many guns do you have, Weston? And I do a mental calculation, I say, 17. 17 seems like a lot of guns. 17 is a lot of guns. I mean, how many can I hold in one hand, my hands, right, two? So I have 17 guns. But I, as I explained to them, you know, many of them are hand-me-downs. And in, I've, mm. I've only bought one gun in my life, but the, all the rest were given to me. Yet, I'm sitting there having 17 guns. And it's kind of hard to uh, defend myself as being not gun crazy when I have 17 guns. I, I would echo that. I, I'm a pretty liberal guy, uh, but I own 19 guns. There you go. Uh, <laughs> about half of them are hand-me-downs. The others are ones I bought. I enjoy sh- target shooting. It, it's It's... A, a very relaxing pastime for me. Um, I don't hunt. I couldn't bring myself to shoot an animal. I mean, sure, if we were starving, yeah, I could shoot an animal if it meant feeding my kid, but I don't enjoy going out and hunting. But I love shooting at bottles and paper targets and stuff. Um, but before I answer your question, to build on your anecdote, anybody familiar with Tim Levin? See yeah, the silence on, on Netflix. Yeah. All right, I've known Tim as long as I've known you, so 20 years. Yeah, me too. Uh, his second visit here to the States, he came to stay for a week at my home. And he'd, he'd written about guns in his fiction, but Tim lives in Wales, uh, where 
I don't think the policemen have guns. You know, it's the old Robin Williams adage of the, the cops say stop or I'll say stop again. Um, <laughs> and yeah. we, took him, we took him out to the range. And, you know, we let him fire a couple different handguns, a couple different rifles. He was very nervous at the beginning. By the end of the day, he was, you know, bam, 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 hitting the bullseye. But there was an immediate change in his fiction. He could describe the weight of the gun in the character's hand. He could des describe the smell. Uh, the sounds, mm -hmm. you know, it, the realism increased overnight for him. But to, to go back to your original thing, it's a combination of, of what you both said. Like Jonathan, my father was in Vietnam. He was uh, 82nd Airborne. Uh, you know, my grandfather uh, was radio man on a bomber over the Pacific during World War II. Uh, my beloved great uncle, uh, you know, was in D-Day. He was in the Navy. Um, my father did not talk about Vietnam at all, nor did any of my friends' fathers. So it was all sort of a mystery for me. Um, but when I joined, you know, what Lee said about the brotherhood, uh, mm. uh, the best friends I've ever had in my life were the guys I served with. And, and even though we only served together for four years, we've, and we were, you know, 18, 19 year old kids, but we've stayed yeah. in contact all this time, um, you know. It's it's something that's very hard to put into words, even for a writer. Uh, but you know, it's I I guess it would kind of be like the guys you're in prison with. Maybe a little bit yeah, less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 go and talk about that brotherhood because I think the brotherhood in military fiction is so important. Yeah. Because you have you have a group of men and women who have gone through a thing, whether it's a crucible in the Marine Corps or it's basic training and other things or it's you know whatever in, in, in any of the military they've gone through something that um, so many civilians have not gone through I mean I think I think the current um, statistic is that one percent of America ha is is has gone through the military and you have 99 percent who haven't gone through it and let's talk about how how um, in the writing of it uh, specifically thinking of Band of Brothers and how successful that was mm -hmm. because the characters were so into each other and they're so the repartee was so perfect right um, let's talk about how when you when you write this stuff how um, uh, you think about the relationships between the characters well, you all want to, go first? Oh, yeah, to that to that point I the most important thing I ever learned about the military was the first time I heard the phrase that it's, you know, I don't fight for my flag, I don't fight for my country, I fight for the guy next to me. Mm. Yeah. That made so much sense to me because, you know, I, I was in high school right as the Vietnam War was ending. And, you know, so none of us were in, in, enlisting after high school. That, you know, that just wasn't happening right after the Vietnam War. <laughs> and I, and we, we had, you know, when I, was, when I was younger, it was all about the protests and, and the, the demonizing of the soldiers over there. But then we start hearing the stories, you know, about the people who, you know, these guys coming back and, and how none of them went over there for us, any political idea. Most people don't know what the hell that war was about anyway. They didn't go over there for that. They went over there because they were drafted. They fought because of the guy next to them, and they all wanted to go home. Um, it, it, it made it a much more human and also more terrifying experience. My, uh, my heart began to break for the guys who had had to go over there and also to want to know what it is that got them through every long night over there. Yeah. It became a different kind of, of perspective on, on the military because, you know, as a kid, you know, growing up in the 60s, everything was World War II. The show Combat was my favorite show as a kid, right? And it was us versus them. Good guys, bad guys, no gray area. It was that. And, you know, the war in Europe seemed somewhat cleaner, especially in black and white television. Vietnam was, was messy and confused, and you know, everybody was on, on different sides of it. And I didn't understand it until I started hearing those stories. And then somebody told me, and I wish I remember who, who it was, said, you know, I, I, I just fought for the guy next to me, and he was fighting for me. And we were hoping we'd both come home. That told me everything I needed to know to be able to, uh, to, to, to move toward true understanding. And yep. uh, um, that, was, you know, that, that was huge for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I was lucky enough to not serve during wartime. Um, yeah, I got I got out right before Desert Storm broke loose. But uh, even during peacetime, 
you know, particularly on a ship, you're you're away from home. Not only away from home, you're away from land. Shared misery. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're you're on a confined space where you can only go so far with two hundred other sailors and four hundred marines. Um, you have got to learn to get along, and uh, you go through everything together. You know, uh, I, I remember. Uh, my high school sweetheart back home, she broke up with me while I was out in the middle of the North Atlantic. And, uh, you know, I got the helicopter lands and you get the letter. These days, of course, they get emailed. But back then, you had to wait four <laughs> to six weeks to get a letter. And she dumped me by letter. And, I, you know, I'm sitting up on the signal bridge in the middle of the dark North Atlantic. And, uh, but I'm not alone. My brothers are there going through it with me and, and vice versa. You know, people, people would lose family members back home. Uh, their dog would die, you know, or, or you know, just just the 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 horror of being stuck on that ship. People would lose their minds; they'd go crazy. We we, we had a, a I don't mean go crazy in a derogatory way, but it's what well, we had. We had a guy cut his wrists in the shower. You know, you go through that together. You have no choice but to go through it together, um, and it, it really builds bonds that last, last you forever. Yep. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, obviously I've not been in the military, so I can't, you know, I can just imagine what that situation is like. I think one of the things, and, you know, I, I put myself in the place I, I am in the last 10 kilometres of an ultra marathon. And I have run a couple. And, and one, ultra and, marathon? Yeah. What? And I think the thing is that, that it's the same thing, isn't it? You're, you're trying to survive something massive and okay there's no one firing at me but you know when you're running an ultra marathon you're against the terrain you're against the weather you're against the clock and and you have some people around you and it's really interesting because it's very similar to the military they come from all walks of life you know when you, i'm a and very very average runner <clears throat> you know there's no world class times and so you know at the back of the pack you know you're with the big guys i'm sorry the big guys are at the back because they're not thin and you know antelope like so they are at the back of the pack. Um, you're with, you're with, you know, mums, and you're with older, older people, and you, and you're with young women, and you're with this really diverse group of people from different walks of life. You know, just because you're wealthier doesn't mean you run faster. You know, and so, and I think that's like the military, isn't it? Because you know, you, these brothers come there's from a, anywhere. There's a, a democratization yeah, in the military where and, everybody's and equal to totally. Foxhall. Totally. And yeah. then also the geography, you know, and the culture. They all come from different places. And, and so I think that that is very similar. So when I'm thinking about these survival things, and of course I put all my writing in the jungle or in the forest of New Zealand. So I've done that. I've run the trails of New Zealand. I know what's there pretty much. And, um, and so, you know, when you're in those last 10 kilometers, and for you, would that be the last six miles? And you've run... 70 kilometers, so you know, 50 miles. You know, you're suffering, you are nearly dead, and those people around you are like, Come on, you can do it, you can do it, we can do it, we can get to the end. And that's the mindset I put myself in when I'm writing this military fiction, and I'm thinking of brotherhood, and I'm thinking of how can we get through this, and that's exactly what you're saying, Jonathan, of you know, how can we make this together? Because even though we have to take the steps ourselves, we've got to make it together. So before we um, dodge into, into military and horror, I want to talk about the big elephant in the room. I want to talk about PTSD. Mm -hmm. Because, because when, when we deal with military fiction, we have to deal with PTSD. Yeah. Because when you see something, you can't unsee it. When you experience something, you can unexperience it. It affects you. It affects different people differently. I have PTSD. I'm taking 10 milligrams of Lexapro every day to help me with my PTSD, and, and thank God for that. Uh, you know, I was in Afghanistan last year, and, and it was not a good time. And, and, but, that, but I'm not alone. I mean, it's not just military people. It's, it's nurses. It's policemen. It's firemen. It's, it's abused children. It's abused children. I mean, there's so many people with PTSD. It's, it's housewives. It's house husbands. I mean, anybody on the street, and what I've learned... What I've learned is that when I see a guy road raging on the highway, I no longer hate them. I feel, I feel bad for them. I let them pass because, you know, they might be experiencing just a moment of PTSD. But I want to ask you guys, um, when you're writing your fiction, your military fiction, how do you approach PTSD in fiction? That's a great question yeah. um, because it's, it's something 
I'm working on right now. Those who don't know, I, I just about killed myself last year. Uh, no bullshit. I, I lit myself on fire. Uh, Oops. My son, he was 10 at the time, he's 11 now, he saw me, he saw my elbow bone exposed and the sinew underneath and my skin dripping down my arm like candle wax. And for months afterward, I was focused on him. Surely he must have PTSD from this. And, you know, we go to a counselor together and talk about it. He bounced back fine. Uh, my girlfriend, author Mary San Giovanni, kept delicately suggesting to me that perhaps I had PTSD as a result of this. That's ridiculous. I'm Brian fucking Keen. I'm fine. It wasn't until about a month ago that I finally broke down and admitted to her, yeah, you know what? I guess I have a little PTSD from this. Um, but I didn't come to that realization until the book I'm working on right now, where the character has PTSD from something very different. But I realized, oh, shit, you asshole. You knew you had PTSD all the time. You've been trying to work it out through this book. Um, which I guess is what writers do, yeah. you know. But Every book's about worth about four good months of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I... I uh, I went through some weird stuff as a kid. My father was a career criminal, head of the local chapter of the KKK, and a legendary asshole. And so, you know, we were, my sisters and I were, were pretty badly abused. Um, but just growing up, there's, there's stuff that people encounter, you know, it leaves a mark. Uh, early on, one of, my, one of my martial arts instructors, he was, teach, he was about to teach us a workshop in, um, in pain management, pain control, when you're, when you're doing techniques, pressure points and joint locks and so on. And he, you know, he said, if you do any of this and you inflict pain, even if it's not lasting pain, it's going to leave a mark. Every bit of violence leaves a mark. Violence always leaves a mark. Yeah. It became such a huge thing um, because then, I, you know, years later I went to bodyguard work. The first time I ever defended myself against a real attack. I mean, um, there was a guy trying to kill the person I'm protecting, and he had a, this guy had a knife, and I had to do bad things to him to stop him. It was a very ugly moment. It, you know, the dojo doesn't prepare you for the sound of breaking bones and the screams. It doesn't prepare you for any of that. So I'm, and, and we later found out that the guy was mentally unstable, which doesn't, didn't make it easier, because now here's somebody who's mentally unstable who I've just put in the hospital for a long time. And I've got scars on my wrist from trying to take the knife away from him, and, you know, up to the point where I realized that trying to take the knife is stupid, I should just break his arm or something. And the or something became the, the plan. Um, so when I started writing about this stuff in fiction, the first thing I did was, was explore what the effect is going to be on these characters. You know, why does somebody who is, you know, like a, a teenager in Baltimore, who is the main character in my story, grow up to become a spec ops guy? First he went in the ar army, and then he went in, into um, police, and then he got recruited to this special ops group. Um, why would somebody allow that to happen to him? What are the forces at work in his life? What scars did life inflict on him? So I went through all that. In fact, not only did I include that in the backstory, but in the anthology, uh, Joe Ledger Unstoppable, where I invited some of my writer friends to write Joe Ledger stories, he wrote the sequel to the events that forged this character and had me ugly crying on a bus. You <laughs> bastard. Um, so, but violence always leaves a mark. I've never, and I've been in a lot of confrontations as a bodyguard and as a bouncer and so on, and um, even winning the fights doesn't mean you walk away un unscathed. It always leaves a mark. I can remember every fight I've been in where I've had to hurt somebody. I remember every fight I've been in where I've been hurt. Um, and I've had some bad injuries over the years. Uh, it always leaves a mark. Now, that mark can affect you in different ways. I know I have some, some version of PTSD. Um, I don't know what the scope of it is because it manifests in different ways because we don't always know what the trigger is. Once that scar is there, that scar is sitting on a trigger. And it might, who knows what's going to push it. And you have an emotional range larger than you suddenly thought you did. I try to put that in my character's experience so that I try to explore it while the characters are going through it. Because otherwise the characters would be flat. I mean, yeah. you need oh to have the, the characters just expanded and three-dimensional. They have to have a, I mean, I mean, I, I know, I know that in, in Walking Dead, people can go around killing zombies, but I mean, these were still people, and and, and they, yeah. there should be so much more PTSD in the Walking Dead well, than there really. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I just have to have one last thing about that. So, Alcon Pictures recently picked up my Rotten Ruin series, 
which is about growing up after the zombie yep, apocalypse. I got that. And, Good job. And the, the discussion I had with the vice president and the two the, the co CEOs was all about what makes Rotten Ruin different. And the thing is, every you know, every person who became a zombie was a human being who died in fear and in pain. Their lives were stolen away from them. They're often the people that were in your life, your neighbors and friends. You're yep. no way you're just going to kill them the way they do in the movies and walk no. away from that unscathed. Yeah. It's going to fuck you up yep. forever, yeah. forever. And to ignore that in, in any zombie fiction is to ignore the humanity of every character involved in it, even if they're no longer actually alive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, you know, I draw on my own experiences. I suffer from depression and anxiety, so yes, I can draw on those. And I have started, I, ha I have got um, the PTSD element in, in my main character's psyche, and that mm -hmm. sort of drives him. Um, but really, it's something I'm wanting to explore in the second series, so I won't say too much more. But I have to say, you did it brilliantly in your Alien... Grit Life. Yeah. Grit Life series. Loved that. Absolutely loved that. It Thank was you. basically PTSD in a nutshell. And it, it was. It really was the theme. I loved that book. I absolutely loved Thank it. Thank you. So what she's talking about is, so I, I had a series from Solaris... Um, um, called Grunt Life. Well, well Grunt, Grunt Life is the first book. Grunt Life, Grunt Trader, Grunt Hero. And uh, um, the um, idea was to have a group of PTSD sufferers intentionally be hired because they're PTSD sufferers because they can better fight the aliens because of the brain chemistry. And because of that, uh, the publisher, the, the, the editor was like, oh my god, Grunt Life is so bleak. And then he saw the next yeah. one, he says, oh my god, this is even bleaker. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you get, you get a whole bunch of PTSD sufferers, and like, and like John and, and Lee and, and Brian talked about, you have gallows humor and you have a bunch of people talking to mm -hmm. each other. Guess what they're talking about? They're talking about all the bad shit that happened to them, not the good shit that happened to them. And everyone's trying to outdo themselves in the bad shit. And, it, and it's tough. And it's been a trigger. And I, I, I have trigger warnings through it. And I've had, I've had vets say, dude, this is a trigger. It's hard. But then I've had vets come to me. I had, I had one father come to me. And let me share this with you. I had one father come to me through my uh, website. He, he emailed me. And, um, and, and I'm not like... I'm not like like this big guy over here. I don't. I don't gush and cry all the time, but, but, uh, but I do cry Pretty some. Known his emotions. I'm just saying. I do cry some. I've seen him cry. <laughs> <laughs> I do cry sometimes. And so we have a. So there was a scene in the first book, Grunt Life, where, um, you know, different people treat their PTSD differently. And there was a scene where one of the main characters, Michelle, mm. she's a cutter. And she and she explains to the other main character. Um, her love interest, why she's cutting herself, right? I'm not a cutter. My daughter wasn't a cutter. I don't know any cutters. I don't know any of those. But I did a lot of research because I really wanted to, you know, try and try and honor the character. And um, what ended up happening was um, a father wrote me and said, so I have a daughter. She's a cutter. She's a self-harmer. And I've been trying to understand her for years and years and years, and I can't make her stop. And... And I just begged her. She read this one paragraph of yours that you wrote. And she said, yeah, Dad, that's, the way, that's why I did it. That's why I do this thing to me. And um, he, felt, he felt not quite at peace, but at least he understood why his daughter was doing this to herself. And at that point, I, I kind of felt a certain satisfaction, as terrible as that might sound, because I was able to like crystallize something that... I was trying to figure out about PTSD in such a way as an author that would like benefit, you know, somebody who read it. And I think that's important because, I mean, it's it's too easy to have a PTSD sufferer be on top of a water tower shooting down at people. It's too easy to have a PTSD sufferer um, being the road rage guy. It's too easy to have a PTSD sufferer being the bad guy. Guess what? Every good guy in every military fiction book, whether it's horror, yeah. sci-fi, or whatever, suffers from PTSD. And as a writer, you guys need to make sure that's done. And as a reader, you need to look for it. And, and, and if you don't see it, well, 
contact the author and say and say BrianKeen.com WTF motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, one of the first books written about PTSD is Rambo, but unfortunately because of the movies, people lost sight. That's a brilliant and first blood nuanced yeah. novel. Yeah. First blood yeah, about PTSD, and it, it it should have stood as a landmark book, and it was eclipsed by a stupid series of movies. Uh, the first one wasn't bad, but it still wasn't the book. Um, you know, you know, going in there, it's going to get bleak as shit. And it's not going to get. There's no, no sunny moment at the end of that book. It was a horrible story written just after the Vietnam War, and you know, David wasn't in the David Morrell who wrote it wasn't in the military either. But he talked to a lot of. He people did. Yeah, you've got he did. To that was a great book. Yeah. You do have to talk to a lot of people. So I'm sorry, we're, we're halfway into this, and I haven't talked about horror. So let's talk about horror for a second, okay? I like so, monsters. so. Um, my favorite, and my first experience of a military horror book, right, was The Keep by F. Paul Wilson. And, and Uncle Paul is here this weekend, so if you haven't seen him, make sure you say hi to Uncle Paul. He's a great guy. Um, in fact, if, if, if you really want to egg him on, say, the, say yeah, the movie was so much better than the book, <laughs> he will love you for that. He will knife you. Because Don't he you. hates the You're movie. The Although I love the movie too, but I mean, the fir- that, that was my first experience, and I'm like, Holy smokes, you can have military and horror together. So let me ask you guys, um, putting you on the spot, um, think about military and horror, um, what do you guys like? I mean, early influence the keep, uh, absolutely. I, I distinctly remember buying it at, off the newsstand, and, and I bought it for the cover, and it, was, it blew me away. And also, uh, DC Comics used to have a, a monthly comic in the 70s called Weird War. Yep. Yeah, um, I remember that. You know, and I devoured that. Uh, you know, as far as, as modern day stuff, uh, it, it, shit, I can't remember the name of it. Um, Mary and I just watched it. it, it it's uh, a Russian platoon during World War II and, and basically the, the, the... What is it? The Bunker? No, it, but it's similar. It, basically, the Nazis have Dr. Frankenstein working for them. Oh, and, uh, I've seen Overlord? this. Overlord? No, that, that, no that, it's that, not that, Overlord. That's the modern version yeah. of that. Yeah. But it, it's, I, shoot, I can't think of the name of it. it it's fantastic. Um, well, thank you for being ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm, yeah. I'll put it on Twitter when I figure out what it is. It, basically, Frankenstein's creating all these, these it's, it's a body horror movie. Uh, you know, Frankenstein... Not the monster, Dr. Frankenstein himself. Yeah, I want to make sure you know yeah, that. That's a different panel. Um, I don't know. I, I'm blanking on the name because I didn't know you were going to ask that question. Frankenstein's Army, that's yeah. it. Yep, that's it. So. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've always loved anything. I started, I got into the military horror through military science fiction, uh, Starship Troopers, the original, oh, yeah. the, the original story. And uh, some other, you know, uh, science fiction slash. Uh, military, you know, stories that have come out over over the years, but uh, I I I didn't like science fiction horror until Aliens. Then I fell in love with science fiction horror because the I, I, well, that's not true because the thing. John Carpenter's the thing was no really no 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 the the original thing the from original the, world, one. the Howard Hawks Howard Hawks uh, because it was it was military guys as I knew them guys who were joking around with each other even in the midst of crisis because that's the only way they're going to stay on their feet and it was military horror har- har- it just wasn't you know combat troops in military they they, they were in a base and so they were it's their downtime and that was a monster and, and it's like the same thing in Alien I think I think you're recognizing that it's it's a camaraderie between yeah. the people and they're and they're having a good time they're doing what they do every day and then suddenly pow yeah. something happens my favorite military horror actually of all time is dog soldiers this great way I was, yes. I was waiting for someone to mention way that dog soldiers. dog soldiers anyone not seen dog soldiers oh you must I mean I mean we're talking werewolves <laughs> badass and werewolves. great great cast great dialogue um, the whole thing moves really well it was it does. Lee? Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I don't really know. I, I think, you know, I liked military stuff, but um, I used to watch, you know, World War movies in, you know, in the afternoons with my parents, you know, when I did the ironing. And, <laughs> but um, in terms of military horror, yeah, no, I don't know. I just read lots of things with guys with guns. 
you know, and I like, I like science fiction fantasy, I can't really put my finger on anything. And maybe because, you know, there was nothing that I identified with as being local and being, you know, something that was from Ki- was Kiwi or well, you know, it has so to be hard for Kiwis because I mean, yeah. I mean there is not a lot of guns and and, and your military is microtesimal. I mean, yeah, it's good, it's good, but it is microtesimal as you say. And you know, does. I was really lucky with with my Into the Mist series because and I've and I've worked with the Kiwi military, so I totally respect. Well, you probably know my guy. Yeah. You Both probably know Rock Testament. Both of them. <laughs> um, yeah, there's only like eight of you. Yeah, so. there is. It, there is. You know, and they're all in the front row. No, um, we uh, we uh, I was really lucky because. Because I, my sister happened to know the guy who is New Zealand's weapons expert. He is the New Zealand Defence Forces. He is the guy. He does all the purchasing, and you know, he is the one who does all the research. And we only have one guy. Just pointing that out. And um, he is my guy. And the trouble is, you know, of course I can't get through to him because there's this wall, this defence wall. Yeah. Um, but you know, he reads everything and he checks the language and and. Fabulous! Tell me about the things that are coming. That I sh- he'll have to shoot me if he if I tell you nice. and that kind of stuff. He's really well, you know. And I remember he said to me, you know, we were talking about, you know, what could, you know, with these our guys used to use stairs and they don't anymore, but um, they used to use stairs. And he was saying to, and I was saying to him, you know, well, I've got this big ass monster of a, you know, of a. Uh, Spenadon, I called it a Spenadon, which is a, an overgrown tuatara. And, you know, I don't know what its hide's like. It's pretty, it's probably pretty good, you know, and what am I going to do? You know, I, I, I can't just have these soldiers just shoot it. That would be no story. And he said, ah, oh, you know, the status, he said, the penetration's like weasel piss. And essentially, <laughs> that just went straight in the, that just went straight in the book. It was so, so that was good. The New Zealand thing I've <laughs> ever heard. <laughs> so, the penetration is like weasel piss. Absolutely. I mean, and it's like I totally get that. Yeah, it was so good. It was it was so good. So yes, exactly. I was I've been really really lucky to have this guy who he's basically been my he is Tane McKenna. He is my go-to yeah, we guy. Need, we, we need even me who's who's been in the military for a long time. We need people to you know oh, to fantastic. give us info for and sure. I just thought of another one and, and keeping with the New Zealand theme. Uh, oh, Paul oh. Paul Campion. Uh, if you've seen the Naughty List film based on my story, he directed that. He had a, a movie, it's out on Blu-ray and DVD and streaming, called The Devil's Rock, it's, uh, set in World War II, fantastic, cool. demonic yeah. war horror movie. Really? Really. Yeah. Go for that. And I, I actually had one that I loved as a, as, as a teenager and still do is um, Unit in Doctor Who stuff. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. The yeah. Brigadier uh, Lethbridge Stewart's, you know, uh, uh, chap with the wings, six six rounds rapid, it was shooting a demon, you know. That was a great throwaway yeah. line, the cool, you know, military... Fighting a demon, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me give you guys a chance to, to, to pimp what you think is your best military horror book, right? Each of you guys. Uh, let's start with Brian and kind of move across. Um, I'd have two, and I won't go into length about either of them because I, I want to save time for everybody. But uh, the first one is a, uh, a short story called uh, Babylon Falling, which is set during Iraq. It's a tank recovery unit, and... Uh, they think they're fighting the Fedayeen, who were Saddam's really special special forces, and yep. instead it turns out they're fighting something far worse. And uh, the comic book series I did, The Last Zombie, which is set after the zombie apocalypse, and this this team of, of what's left of our military and what's left of our, our civilian scientists have to band together and try to rebuild America. Um, and the horror of it was just how the hell do we rebuild? Who did the last zombie? Uh, Antarctic Press put it out. Right, that's right. And uh, I, I can't say much, but uh, you're going to see it in a different form other than a comic book. Uh, there should be an announcement sometime this summer. That's cool. So. Cool. That's cool. Lee? Oh, anything by these guys? No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. The favorite one you've done. Oh, no, my favorite one. My, oh, it's always the last book, isn't it? It's always the one you've just it done, is, and the next is. one's going to be even better. It so is, it's it always is. the last book. So tell it's us called, about it. It's called um, Into the Ashes, and it's down Into the, the Ashes? Yeah, yeah. It's set on New Zealand Is Central it a dealer's Plateau. room? Yeah. What's it about? Um, it's about, uh, it's basically set on New Zealand Central Plateau, and it, it, it looks at, um, it looks at landscapers' ancestors. What does that mean? Yeah, ba- in New Zealand, um, our people consider their, the landscape 
to be part of their ancestry. So we have something that's called the Pepeha, and when we introduce ourselves, we tell you which is the mountain we identify with and which is the river we identify with. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've incorporated that into the story. So although we don't have a monster in this one, we do have this idea of the landscape as being part of our family and you know how dysfunctional family can be. That's really what the story okay. is about. Nice. Um, well, I, uh, the Joe Ledger series has a lot of that stuff in it, but of those books, I think Predator 1 is, is, it has, my most, has my favorite military stuff in it. Because I, I got to, you know, go on to a bunch of military uh, bases and, and even went out on a nuclear sub. Uh, I happened to, at a, an event in California, got to meet the Admiral of the Pacific Submarine Fleet and the, uh, the Force Master Chief. And so that was really, really cool. Um, but that one uh, probably has the most military in it. But also... Some of my short stories, the one I did for her, uh, All the oh, Devils Are Here, for so Hellboy. Oh, good. You know, it was, it was basically what a small group can do. You know, three guys. And what three highly trained soldiers can do when they know each other so well, they have each other's backs, they don't have to worry about, you know, like the, the leader of the troop, the group doesn't have to tell everyone how to fight. They know how to fight. And they, and they know how to fight together. And I had a lot of fun with that. It was also somehow brought in the War of the Worlds. So H.G. Well, I don't know how I did that. It was in spiders. Happy there were spiders. Giant spiders. There were yeah. giant spiders. It's um, down in the dealer's room. Yeah. You can get a copy. But it's the only place you can get it. <laughs> and it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, and I, it's, it's weird because I, I sometimes hear from military guys uh, who are fans of the books, and you expect them to like the stuff that's more conventionally military, but the guys who have, who have been in spec ops who have done some really weird shit over the years and stuff they can't talk about, they'll like some of the weirder stuff yeah. because it reminds them of something they can't tell me about. <laughs> maybe that's why. That's yeah, why I when, yeah, yeah, maybe that's why. Hmm. So, so I've written the SEAL Team 666 series and the Grunt Live series, and those are great. Um, but I think the one I'm most proud about that has, I think the most PTSD and it, most interesting is what I wrote for you. And I wrote this in Afghanistan uh, in 2013. It was for volume two of V Wars, and then a sequel, volume three of V Wars, um, which is soon to be a Netflix, Netflix TV show. Netflix show in November. Um, uh, I, I created a band. So the whole idea of V Wars is that every single um, ethnic group on the planet, um, some junk DNA might be spurred, and suddenly you're a vampire, but based upon your ethnicity, right? So I have, I have Draugr. I have I have about six Viking vampires with go cams who go into take out terrorists on a pay per view schedule, and <laughs> and it's a badass story. And it's actually pretty badass. It's it's it was a good idea. It was a great idea. But the main character and what happens to him and his family is just yeah. really terrible. No spoilers. And no no spoilers. But it's really hard. And then he has to in the next story. I really give him the hard PTSD, don't I? Yep. To where he's now dealing with the loss of something and uh um it's 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 really good it's, it's it was nice it was it was nice to be able to write in that universe i mean what's what's interesting is when you write in somebody else's universe where you don't own the ip so you're doing a work for hire you know that you're going to you know lose any chance of you know being able to write in that universe again and some people kind of just phone it in and some people throw it all in and with john i really kind of threw it all in i think he knew it because um mm -hmm. uh those i mean pay-per-view go cam vampires come on so who's ever bad. thought of that i own that right <laughs> that's me nobody else has that so um in that light so we have about uh 10 12 minutes left um so let's get questions from the audience so who has questions the guy in the back sir all right. And somebody mentioned the Marines in the Crucible. I did. There's a jarhead in here? I did, yeah, there's a there's there's a couple jarheads in here. Well, they still even they don't want to talk about. They still you down in your essence. And everybody in the platoon of your company has seen you in your essence. And then they accept you for what you want. Right. And the reason I don't believe a lot of military fiction is that how do you convey that? Unwritten page, I think some of you have talked about that. So it's hard to get it right. 
Well, there's some there's some folks who get it right. I mean, these guys on the table and John Ringo and a couple other folks, they really get it right because they've been in the military and they're able to do it. And, and Lee, gosh, I don't know how she does it because she hasn't been in the military, but she's able to convey it in such a way that you're like, nobody would ever know that she hasn't been in the military. Thank you. Because, because her writing is so right spot on. But I think that's because as a, as a human, she was able to, you know, dissect what it means to be part of a group of men who've been through something or a group of women who've been through something and then and then put that on the other side and say, okay, this is the result of who they are after they've been through something. Yeah, I, I sat in a room with um, uh, a couple of uh, JSOC guys who were from different branches of the military. And it's interesting, they, they were, you know, I was interviewing them, trying to get their stories, and they were talking a lot not necessarily about missions so much as being in that life and I was fascinated by the shorthand that they were like, mm. they spoke in, in a kind of a shorthand I, yep. I missed half of it but just the fact that they had all been through something similar in the in the process of becoming that person that you know being stripped down taking away the um, the the civilized a a affectation down to you know pure person and then rebuilding in, into something else, they could have a conversation that I, no matter how much research I do, I can never do, but I was able to get some of it for my characters. But it, it is a fascinating process that they are not being who they, they were raised to be. They're being made into something else. It's fascinating. It's also scary because you know we, we spend a lot of time training people. We don't spend a lot of time training them for civilian life, and that's been a problem for years. And that is something we writers try to explore, you know, try to understand how do they go from that. Because the, if you take one of us, somebody who's not military, put us in that situation, that's a fucking horror story right there. That is, that is scarier than Monsters and Godzilla right there. And it, this is what they do. They're actually in there to do that. And then they have to come home and not be that. That's, that's, a, that's something that as writers, you know, as a writer, I'm going to be continuing to explore my whole life in, in fiction. I, t I took Mary to a reunion in Norfolk a couple years ago and uh, you know introduced her to all my buddies those those who are still with us and uh, I guess her and some of the other wives and some of the other girlfriends were, were talking separately and they said watching us together it's very obvious we share something that even though we're very open with our partners we share something that they will never be able to share with us right um, I don't know if I do it consciously or subconsciously, but I, I, I know if I'm writing those kind of characters, I'm basing it on my buddies. I mean, if any of them bothered to read my books, they're a bunch of illiterates, they, they don't read my books. But, uh, <laughs> but if they did, they'd see themselves, I'm sure. You know, that's, that's how I try to capture it. By the way, last year in Afghanistan, I was with JSOC. Okay. So, Jim? Yeah, uh, first, John, I, what you said about that massive like retrograde transition of like reverse culture shock, mm -hmm. highly recommend Sebastian Unger's book, Tribe. If you yeah, oh, yeah, Sebastian yeah. Unger, yeah. 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 Um, so Hold I'm on, if anyone doesn't know Sebastian Younger, Sebastian Younger is a, is a um, journalist who has embedded himself in the military for the last 25 years. And uh, he, he, he writes multiple books about multiple things, but um, if you ever want to read what it is like to be in the military from a civilian point of view, Sebastian Younger is that person. Yeah. Because, I mean, he writes it better than anybody else. Sorry. The tribe's amazing. Yeah, and he definitely takes away, like, all the jingoism and stuff. It's like, you don't, like, you don't have to be in the military to experience, uh, um, like, the, the reverse culture shock and, and you know, uh, transitional type uh, episodes that he says is actually one of the bigger uh, entities within what we call PTSD. However, um, I digress. I have a question that has nothing to do with art. It has a bit more to do with business. Um, my first two books, one was military nonfiction, very transgressive memoir. The second one was a military poetry book that uh, was nationally recognized. I got to meet Jim Mattis. I, that was just to kind of get out of my system. I've always, this is where I've always wanted to be and, and um, plan to stay. How, speaking of transitions, do you recommend um, melding, going from something that is like on the opposite end of the, the writer's galaxy from military nonfiction to... Uh, uh, dark fantasy fiction, such as far as how to—I don't know. What's your real question? Is your real question how to be how to be mass published? Well, I, I mean, it's almost like schizophrenic. How can you how can you have a brand? No, I mean, you know? there are a lot of writers. I just did a, a talk about this earlier today about uh, cross genre because you know I, I write 
comics, middle grade, young adult in two different categories, adult fiction in seven genres, um, it, and nonfiction. Uh, it's all under the same brand. He's such a slacker. Um. Unbelievable. <laughs> the point being that if, if you establish the brand as you writer, okay. everything else is a, is a byproduct of your brand. You don't need to worry about uh, whether it's it's greatly disparate. You know, who cares? It's you writing. Yes, and that was you as a brand. Somebody with, if, with great range. If I can share a word of advice from Joe R. Lansdale, his own self. A couple years ago, Joe and I are hanging out. We're in my Jeep. We're going out to eat. And uh, we were talking about uh, an Edgar Rice Burroughs pastiche, a novella he'd written. And I, I said, man, I'd love to write something like that. You know, but 40 books in, I'm a horror writer. And he looked at me and he said, you're Brian fucking Keen. You can write whatever you want at this point. <laughs> And he's right. Yeah. Um, and, and you can, too. You write what you want to read. Just tell the story you want to read. Don't worry about genre. Don't worry about classification. Let your agent and the editor and the publisher figure out where, where exactly. it should be marketed as. Just and write and if you want to establish yeah. yourself as, as, a, as a writer of a particular thing, like you want to write about PTSD or whatever, do it. Do it and be the best at it possible. So I had my SEAL Team 666 books, all three books. And by the time the second book came up, uh, Solaris out of the UK, uh, a big time a big time mass market publisher, said, hey, we, we want to do Weston Oaks book. And I gave them a page. They said, okay, so fine. Because because it was the popularity of those other books that made them want to sign me for these books. And it's, it's because those were so good. I poured myself so much into them that they liked them. So, I mean... I mean, at the end, at the end of the day, it's product. You have to do product, and I think what we've been talking about here is that in military fiction, whether that's horror or not horror, or whatever, you have to really have the characters at heart, and you have to understand that there's a price to be paid for being in the military and for doing what they do, right? So, so if you're going to have people killing people, they got to pay mentally, physically, whatever. They can't just do it and move on, right? Question back there. Hi. 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 Um, I was a super squirrel in the Navy and the Air Force. Um, so I'm always kind of looking for other women in, um, in military fiction. And what kind of conversations are happening with like, a lot more women, and also women who aren't necessarily <coughs> going to be sexual objects, or women who um, need to get close to someone. So you member of HWA? Yes, I am. Well, then I invite you to open up a topic on the HWA message board about military women in, in fiction. Mm -hmm. Right? Open that up and, and see who, who applies. I think you'll be able to find those. Yeah, I, I mean, I we don't have the answers here, but, well, but there's so many of us in the, in the community that you can't be the only one. Write right. it. And, and I know for a fact that editors are looking for it. Yeah, write um, it. Yeah. More than they ever have, they are looking for strong women writing about strong women. Yes. And, and you know, the, the only reason there's not enough of it out there is because not enough of it has been set, sent into publishers. Do it, write it, and if Send you can't it. find an editor, drop me an email. I'll, yeah. I'll help you find the, the agent or editor who at least will read it. Were you an IS-1? No, it's a CPR. Okay. I got it. And there's that shorthand again. Yeah. <laughs> there was another question up closer, too. Yes, sir. So military folks, especially veterans, tend to react differently than civilians do. How do you have to modify your horror for that? They're probably not going to be as caught as flat-footed. They're going to probably get over the, oh, my God, this can't be happening, and probably react aggressively uh, as a, a unit. How do you modify the horror? How, what scares those kind of people? What what scares a a vet? I would I would say the same things that still the scare a civilian. Um, you know, if my when when my kid not my my youngest son now but my older boy when he was little he was uh, playing in the driveway and I literally turned my back for a second to throw a frisbee for the dog and I heard tires screeching and I turned around and here he had ran out in the road. That scares everybody, no matter whether you've served or whether you haven't. I, I think so take that to like a military fiction novel. You have a group of men, right? A group of men, women, a combination, whatever. It doesn't matter. You have a team. right? You've been in the military, yeah? Okay, so so you have a bunch of vets. Vets, as as John said, they don't care about the flag. They don't care about, about preaching. They don't care about the president. I mean, they do, but what they really care about is the man and woman to the left and right of them. And so you put them in danger, and suddenly there goes your plot, 
right? You put those people in danger. Yeah, and, and, and you do bad things to them, and then and then your main characters want to get back and find out and, and, and get back and and do something to those people who did bad things. Yeah. One of the similarities between uh, military and martial arts is uh, there are times training will take over. That's why yeah. training is there. So if they're in a, if, if the character's in a situation, uh, a group of civilians do not have training to fall back on. A military, they could still be in shock and horror, but they have training to fall back on. Sometimes the routine of the process Muscle of memory. is yep. going to pull them through it, and that becomes a military science fiction story as opposed to a non-military science fiction story. It's not horror, but I would point you to Oliver Stone's Platoon if yeah. you haven't seen it. The, what a great the characterization movie. It's better there, every year. The way that, you know, that platoon is a band of brothers. And the way they splinter between Barnes and Elias, mm -hmm. it's some very effective characterization. And you can easily apply that to, to so a we horror have to, story. We have to stop this right now, but I want to end it with this. And this is a perfect thing. Thank you, Brian. Um, on Amazon, uh, I, there is a documentary that takes everybody from from Platoon um, 20 or 30 years later and, and they talk about the whole making of it oh, wow. and they and it's really it's impressive because you know everybody on Platoon had to go to, they went they made them go through six weeks of basic training <laughs> they did so that they could get that camaraderie together and it was automatic because if you watched a the movie they're not acting anymore it's real it's yep. it's real so my wife hasn't my wife hasn't seen Platoon and what I want to do is I want to have an afternoon and a night where we watch the documentary first and then, then we watch the movie second because those of you who know Platoon, it's a hell of a movie. Because I saw it with a Congressional Medal of Honor winner from Vietnam, and, and he walked out of there saying, I never want to see this fucking movie again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. All right, so there you have it, folks. One more time, let me tell you about Melanie. Melanie has always been attracted to assertive, dominant, alpha males. She's always been curious about sadism and masochism, bondage and submission, but when she meets a man on an online BDSM website who calls himself Slave Master, she will experience a level of sadomasochism that goes far beyond safe, sane, and consensual. Inspired by the true story of America's first online serial killer and from the twisted minds of Wrath James White and Christopher Rufty comes Master of Pain, available right now on Amazon in both Kindle and paperback. Once again, that is Master of Pain. Obedience is mandatory, Matt, and safe words are not allowed. All right. Just I, I want I want full brownie points for not giggitying the whole time you read that ad. You you were very good about. I that was very well ad. behaved. You were. Yes. Every time you read that ad, She's I still I thinking about Mary. The She's naked as well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, I also want to point out. Okay, now uh, in that panel discussion we just heard, um, there's a question from the audience, and I think the audio picked it up. Uh, that's actually from author David Rose. Okay, he's got a book out called No Joy, A Recon Marine's Tales of Self-Destruction. It's a, it's a true story about PTSD. Um, it's been very well received by the military community. I'm reading it right now. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I would, I would urge anyone out there, maybe you're like me, you know, maybe, oh, I don't have PTSD, when mm. in, in fact you fucking do. Um <clears throat> I see you clearing your th hear you clearing your throat over there, Sam Bonnie. Hey, I, I admitted it. I, I admit it during it. the he admits it during the panel. Yeah, which, you know, I, I was happy to see you do that. Yeah, and uh, not for nothing, you were on fire. Yeah, so it I, it's okay. To, yeah, to have PTSD exactly. after after a near death experience. Exactly, but yeah. I I would I would urge anyone with PTSD or anyone who who loves someone with PTSD, particularly. If it's induced from being in the military, mm -hmm. whether wartime or peacetime, uh, to pick up this book and check it out again, it's No Joy: A Recon Marine's Tales of Self Destruction, and that is by David Rose. I also want to thank uh, Jonathan Mayberry. Uh, the tenth book in his Joe Ledger series, Deep Silence, is out now. Uh, Weston Oaks, uh, Burning Sky, on sale right now, and Lee Murray, uh, you know, her Tane McKenna adventure series. Uh, the latest, I believe, is Into the Ashes. Uh, so please, you know, support them uh, because they they all really delivered for that panel. Um, I also want to remind folks our book club discussion for July is Dahmer's Not Dead by Edward Lee 
and Elizabeth Stefan. Um, so if you haven't yet, pick that up, read it, and then you can you can join our discussion in July right here on the show. Uh, before we leave, a reminder, I mentioned it earlier, but Christopher Golden and I, we have a little side project called Defender's Dialogue. Every week we geek out on Bronze Age Marvel Comics. Geekity. We just reached a milestone, actually. Last week was our our 67th episode and we reached the end of the original defenders comic book series Aww. so from here on out it'll be it'll be other marvel comics of the bronze age uh, but the, all the ones that are sort of tied to the defenders it's, it's got to be tied to the defenders okay. and the beauty of that is everybody was a defender at some point <laughs> yeah, yeah so, much. so so you yeah. have sort of an open yeah, you, uh, we landscape do, there. we're gonna do the champions next but we can do son of satan we can do man thing we can do ghost rider we could do luke cage they were all defenders. We could oh, do Daredevil, true. Doctor Strange, Hulk. So yeah, this that podcast could go on for years and years and years. <laughs> um, Mary has a little side project called Cosmic Shenanigans. Um, if you are annoyed by the fart jokes and Howard Stern esque humor of this show, <laughs> then you will. Then, then Cosmic Shenanigans is a show for you because there's none of that. None of, what What are you covering on this week's show, Mary? Uh, this week's show is Daryl Schweitzer. There you go. No fart joke. No fart jokes. Just Daryl Schweitzer. Just Daryl Schweitzer. So there you go. Um, and you may also enjoy uh, a show that is a combination of academia and fart jokes, and that is Grindcast <laughs> that Matt does every week. No pressure. Academia, no pressure huh? to live up to that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you've had enough of podcasts and you just want to watch some TV, tune in most nights to Twitch TV. Slash meteor notes, and you can watch Dave stroke his beard thoughtfully while hollering. I, I at did his not cats. think that's where that sentence was going. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to the we're back to the porn thing again. <laughs> Mary McCheese and the Hamburglar. Uh, slip me between your pickles. <laughs> Just said buns. How do I buns. segue from that <laughs> to <laughs> advertising? I, I don't have no idea. So. If you'd like to slip between the pickles, uh, go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com, right. <laughs> click contact, and send them an email and say, hey, I would like to give money by having my product advertised on the horror <laughs> show with Brian Keene. Next week, Christian Jensen be here. Have no fear. I'm sure it'll all go great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't, no, what no, could possibly no, go wrong? It'll be fine. See you next week, folks. See you, guys. Bye. There Shall Come a Podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue. Marvel Comics' original superhero non-team convenes once again. Comic book writers and authors Brian Keene and Christopher Golden take us back to the 70s and 80s as they discuss Marvel's most dynamic collection of superheroes. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Tuesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.